So, uh, so I, I'm going to speak about uh, swelling materials. So, uh, in fact, the, the, my motivation was uh, tumors uh, or uh, developing tissues. Uh, however, as a continuum, this uh, uh, growing tissue is, is a swelling material, a material that grows. And uh, in fact, there are other occurrences of swelling material in, in, in uh, other areas. So here is a, here is a picture of uh, developing uh, drosophilia uh, larva. Uh, it's called an imago. And uh, so you see this is a, what's a, it's a model for development biology where uh, you're looking at what's called the imaginal disk. So in the larva, you have the, the various, you know, various parts, and then there is one part which is a disk, this, which is going to grow, and this one is going to to become the wing of the fly. So it's a big, it's 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 like a pouch. It's like a, it's like a pouch that grows, and uh, so you see here you have uh, three days, four days, uh, five days imago, and. Uh, that's the top view, and that's the side view. Uh, after some time, after five days, what's happening is that the disc buckles and uh, uh, falls on itself, and then grows a, a two. So that's a, a single layer of cells. By the way, you can see here. Uh, so this is an epithelial layer. So what's staying here are the nuclei, and uh, uh, in fact, you 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 kind of think that there are several layers of cells, but it's a single layer of cells, just the nuclei are not at the same height. Uh, but the top of the cell is here, and the bottom is here. Uh, the top is called the apical, uh, apical side, the bottom is the basal side, they are, there is a polarity, they're not equivalent. And these epithelial uh, sheets are actually uh, what makes most of the uh, what's called epithelial uh, tissues, like uh, the walls of the blood vessels, your brain, uh, the skin. And uh, understanding, uh, so one of the questions is understanding uh, <coughs> how, uh, you know, how an epithelial sheet grows and stops growing. Why uh, does it stop growing? So that's part of a project where Sophie, who is here, is involved actually in modeling. So what we are doing is modeling the, the traffic of the nuclei uh, in the layer, because uh, the nuclei, they go on the top to divide, and then they go back on the bottom. So there is a kind of a strange thing. Um, and these, uh, uh, these images have been uh, taken by our collaborator from the Crick Institute, Jean-Paul Vincent and his group. Uh, so, well, I mean, I'm not going to get into the details of this. Uh, this is a different talk. I was just interesting in the fact that the, the medium is, is growing, is, is, is expanding. Uh, of course, uh, you have a similar phenomenon in tumor growth, where basically uh, cancer can be seen as some cells that restart the development cycle, but uh, where they shouldn't do it. Um, but of course, you have other cases where you, ha you encounter swelling or drying material. Drying material will be the, the con contrary, the material shrinks. So that's the case, for instance, in, in uh, drying soil. So you see that then you find these interesting uh, cr pa patterns of cracks. And also in, in cooking. Eh? So it's a very important application for me, at least. So. Uh, um, Right, so uh, people have been interested in, in, uh, in uh, these kind of things for a long time, and uh, I basically, <clears throat> based on, on two kinds of models, which turn out to be somehow not very different, in the sense that what's, very, what's really interesting in the steady state, so when you have viscosity at steady state, it's not really uh, uh, very important, but anyhow, you have solid mechanics models, uh, relying on the hyperelasticity hyper plus a modeling of the growth through a growth tensor because uh, the growth uh, can be anisotropic. And this, is, uh, this has been basically uh, followed by a physicist or uh, 
people are in between mathematics and physics. So for instance, uh, Martin Benama, who I, I think she is one of the, in the scientific committee on this, uh, this uh, school. Uh, Alain Gorielli uh, in uh, Oxford, Mark Chaplin and others. You also have a uh, more fluid mechanics based model and uh, uh, most of them are based on uh, Darcy's law. In particular, there has been a lot of work by Luigi on this, but others uh, as well. And one of the things that I'd like to do in this, uh, one of the motivation, uh, and it's really started from uh, reading this paper by uh, David Ambrosi and Luigi Preciosi on the validity of Darcy's law. This is really uh, to question the validity of Darcy's law. Because as Luigi has presented before, if the general framework is basically to make it very, very simple, you have a packed medium. So that means that you have a uniform density, which is the packing density, say one. And it, uh, so the continuity equation, uh, dn dt plus divergence of nv equals growth. If n is equal to one, simplifies just in divergence of v equals growth, right? So you have a single equation for a vector. And the problem is to determine this velocity vector and that's called the closure problem. And uh, uh, so for instance, in 1D or if you have spherical symmetry, you can solve the problem. But if you, in, gen in general, you cannot. And uh, uh, one way to solve, uh, uh, to close the problem is to assume that the velocity is a gradient of uh, some field that you could call the pressure, right? Uh, so it gives the simplest answer. Uh, the simplest need, doesn't need to be uh, the best or even correct. So, uh, I mean, I did, I, I, at some point I started to think about what could be uh, the mechanism by which we could get the Darcy's law or something else, right? So this is basically uh, one of the goals of this uh, 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 lecture. And the idea is that, so you've seen uh, in the uh, previous work, some, uh, some people have assumed the hyperelastic material. Uh, we do not know exactly if it's solid mechanics or fluid mechanics, etc. The problem is that determining the material constants of the tissue is uh, very difficult. So we have seen uh, uh, some, there are some experiments uh, using, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, measurement of tension on the substrate and so on. But this is very uh, and indirect me measurement and very imprecise. And so, in spite of the fact that obviously the cells obey some physical laws, <coughs> The problem is that you don't know what are these physical laws. Also, you have to uh, think that this is an active material, so the, there is a in intake of nutrients. The nutrients are metabolized. They produce, and uh, the, the cells use this energy to produce motion. And so it's, uh, it's active physics in the sense that it's not just you know, passive laws of physics. You also have to include this, uh, uh, this addition of, of momentum or or energy, and that follows from a different, say, compartment, which is the biochi biokinetics compartment, which is extremely complicated. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's virtually impossible, at least now, to uh, make a first principles modeling of uh, everything, the biokinetic compartment coupled with a mechanical one. Uh, so uh, in face of this, uh, impossibility of determining what are the physical laws, the uh, alterna alternative is to try to see what's happening if you, if you assume simple heuristics. So what I'm going to show you is a model which really relies on very, very basic simple heuristics. There is a, almost no, no physics or no, uh, uh, no biochemistry. So it's a kind of a null model on which you can add things if you like to uh, to model some uh, more, uh, you know, more phenomena. So in some sense, I would say it's a kind of a zero model. And that will allow us also maybe to, uh, to uh, get, uh, get some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, view of uh, uh, the validity of Darcy's law. Uh, of course, there has been a lot of uh, work done on the question, also on the mathematical side. So for instance, the packing heuristics, the saying that the, the cells are at the, pack, at, the, at the packing density, can be seen as an approximation of a very uh, 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 almost incompressible medium, but slightly compressible. 
So you could start from a compressible model and pass to the incompressible limit. And this is what has been done by Benoit and the co-workers. Uh, uh, for, uh, for starting from uh, models for basically porous media equations, and going to the incompressible limit and getting the packing heuristics. And then this gives rise to the modeling of the boundary. It's actually a, uh, uh, gives rise to a modeling of the boundary of the tumor. So basically a geometric motion. Uh, so this is what I say. It leads to a free boundary problem. So this free boundary problem was actually introduced long ago by Friedman. And this is uh, really similar to what's uh, called the Healy show uh, model for fluid mechanics. So Healy show uh, experiments is typically you take two glass plates very uh, with a very thin gap between the glass plates with a hole in the top glass, you insert water. And what you see is that the, the water expands between the two glass plates and makes a very uh, definite boundary that uh, may expand either uh, radially or may do some fingerings according to some parameters of the material and the, the attachment of the fluid with the, with the glass plate. So it's typically a Healy show experiment. And so you, you can see that the boundary of this drop of water in the two places is akin to the boundary of the tumor growing in the, medi in the medium. Uh, you have also more microscopic models. So there have been a lot of models done, for instance, by the uh, Drasdo team, on, uh, which we would call off-lattice models. So basically particle model or cellular automata models, cellular POTS model, which is a, an elaboration of cellular automata. And there's been also a, a work done by Sebastian Moch and Jan on actually going from uh, some uh, mac microscopic cell-based model into the, the Healy, show, uh, Healy show dynamics. All right, so, so here we are going to use a packing heuristics. And so we are going to build a continuum model, but in spite from the micro model. So, so we're not going to address the uh, question of how to prove convergence from the micro to the continuum, actually, I think that's a difficult problem for the reason that the micro model doesn't have a unique solution. But at least we get inspiration from this micro to get uh, to the continuum model. So that's the plan. And um, so we start with a microscopic background. And uh, so the, the heuristics is the really simple. So you take a bowl. OK, these are beads, so there are, there are holes you know, for the thread. But this has nothing to do with the modeling. It's just that I could not find on internet a better image than this one. right? So forget about the black, uh, black thing. right? So you take beads, and you put them in a bowl. And so if you put the first one, then it's, of course, going to uh, go to the center, because it's a minimum of the, of the potential. But if you add more beads, then they try to arrange to minimize, in some sense, the potential energy, but uh, also to, uh, they cannot overlap. So of course, uh, they have to satisfy the non-overlapping constraint. So they basically, these beads, they're very smart. They solve a constrained minimization problem. Uh, so this one is uh, as follows. It's, uh, you take n spheres, so yeah, here uh, eight, and uh, position the center at xi and radii ri. Uh, so denote by capital X the, the set of positions, capital R the set of radia. And assume that there is a, a, each bead is subject to a potential energy. So if you see this, this bead here on the side uh, has a potential energy which corresponds to the, okay, to the height of the, the bead. I'm going to, to neglect the effects of the... So... Right, so you have, you put the beads, etc. So this one has a potential energy, which is basically uh, its mass, uh, gravitation uh, constant times this, uh, this height. So you see that here, the potential energy is going to be a function of the, of the distance, uh, of the position of the bead, and also it depends on its mass, so it's going to be a function of its uh, volume, right? So in general, I'm going to assume that there is a function of 
the position of the bead and of its radius such that uh, that gives the, uh, the, the energy of the, of the bead with its position at x and radius r, and the total energy of the system, so it's very uh, uncoupled, they are uncoupled, uh, it's just the sum of the individual uh, potential energies, but uh, they need to minimize these energies in an admissible uh, configuration, which is a set of positions where the difference, the distance between the centers is larger than the sum of the radii. Right, so, so the interactions between the bead is only through uh, the uh, constraint, right? And so we try to uh, find a solution of a uh, minimum of this energy in this uh, configuration uh, space. And of course, there is a, a lot of solution. It's a non-convex problem. And uh, you, um, uh, if, you, if you start from a, uh, say a random configuration with possible overlapping, then, uh, then uh, you may wish to find the admissible configuration which is the closest to that one. That's a way to sort of solve the uni uniqueness in some sense, but in any case, uh, in general, there is no uniqueness, and uh, for solving this kind of problem, there has been works by Bertrand and also some works that I did with my former student, uh, Marina Ferreira. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the problem I'd like to address is not this minimization because it's rather, uh, okay, it's rather standard, but ra rather what's happening is now I assume that the potential starts to vary with time. Right, and also what uh, happens is the balls uh, start to have a radius that varies in time. So of course, if the balls, uh, the radius of the ball varies in time, so if this, this ball grows, then they will push the other one. So what I'm interested is really in the motion uh, triggered by the growth under this non-overlapping uh, constraint. Okay, so let me give you an illustration of this that I found on internet, so I hope I'm connected to, uh, to the, because I'm going to try to open, uh, yeah, it looks like it's working, so. Okay, so this is an experiment, I hope you can see it. So that's an experiment uh, using a hydrogel ball. So hydrogel is a polymer that when you put it into the water, swells. So, so it's originally you know, rather compact and then in the water, then somehow the pores open and the medium grows, right? So here I have exactly this, um, this situation where, maybe I could go back, rewind a bit, where I put these beads in the bowl, so you see the, uh, maybe I can, you have these beads in the ball here. They are very small, but they are going to, so here is the initial configuration. You see they are, they are at contact, but then they grow. Okay, it takes some time. And you see by the, when they grow, they are start to push each other. And uh, okay, they do not move a, a lot, but they still move. And basically the question I like to address is uh, how, what is the motion of these balls, right? And uh, can I find equations for the motion of these balls, right? Uh, yes, so, yeah, so, so it's actually amazing. Uh, there is amazing uh, uh, material, actually. You, 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 can, uh, you can find very, uh, very interesting uh, videos on, on, on YouTube about these materials. Um, in particular, if you have a transparent one, and you put it in the water, it swells, and then uh, basically you cannot see it because it really has the same uh, refraction index as the water, so it's basically invisible. And so you put your hand and then uh, you, you raise the ball and all of a sudden you can see it, but it's, uh, it's really magical. Okay. So, but, uh, okay, so this is not really the, the topic. Uh, so yeah, so as I said, I'd like to find a smooth trajectory uh, x of t uh, of uh, made of points that uh, at any given instant minimize this. So you, I'm going to look at what's called an adiabatic evolution. I'm assuming that the motion at any given time minimizes the functional, right? So I'm not, okay. And 
So, so at any given time, x of t is a solution of this minimization problem with a potential that uh, is the, the one given at time t, and with also the radii, the, 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 the configuration space defined by the radii at time t. Okay, so it's a, the solution is, there, is going to vary because of this time dependence here and the time dependence of the radii as well. And I'd like to uh, find a smooth trajectory. As I said, the minimization problem is not unique. So the problem is that you could, uh, if you're not careful, you could uh, jump, right? You could find a solution and all of a sudden decide to, to find another one. So it's, uh, but obviously from the movie, uh, there is a unique solution. Apparently the, uh, the balls do not jump, right? So that should, that should be possible. So one possibility is to, uh, to imagine a time discretization. And imagine that at time yeah, tk, you, so you have a solution of the minimization problem, then increment in time. So then the radii have gone to rk plus one. They are not equal to rk anymore. And also the, the potential v is taken at time tk plus one. So your xk, which was the solution of the minimization problem here, is no more a solution of this new minimization problem. And the problem is now to find a solution xk plus one as close as possible to that solution here, because otherwise you might actually create a jump, right? So if you imagine that this is possible, then you can uh, define the discrete velocity like this. And uh, so if xk plus one is as close to xk, that means that the velocity is as small as possible among the solutions. So this is what I'm going to call the uh, minimal displacement rule. And this is, uh, as a consequence, I, I have a, a, a uh, an, uh, another rule, which is a non-swapping uh, rule in the sense that when you, you grow, then at some point you cannot swap your position, right? Because this would make, this would make a big jump in the, in the solution, right? So we will see the role of this non-swapping uh, rule later. Okay? Uh, so of course this strategy has been already uh, investigated. Actually Bertrand was one of the uh, pioneers in this uh, kind of things for crowd motions. Uh, we have applied it to, uh, to tumor growth modeling, actually, in, uh, in uh, uh, some work. Let me give you some, uh, uh, some, uh, some movies. So for instance, this is uh, uh, the work we've done. Uh, so the, the, this was a, a work together with some biologists in Toulouse, uh, Bernard Ducomin, we were interested in uh, modeling uh, tumor growth and in particular in the role of the uh, orientation of the division in the shape, in shaping the cell lineages. So here each color it corresponds to a single cell at the beginning and so we are following the lineages and we were interested in seeing whether we could say something about the shape of the lineages as a function of the in, uh, of the uh, division rule. So here, actually, you maybe you do not notice, but the division rule is completely <laughs> crazy. It's always divided in the, in the, uh, so the, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the direction of the of the two uh, daughter, uh, the, the center of the two daughter cell is always vertical. Uh, and we have a confining potential. So we we could we would uh, we were able actually to. Uh, to see that there is a uh, there is an impact of the uh, orientation of the division on these uh, lineages, right? Uh, okay. In the talk here, I don't have uh, I don't have a, a division. Actually, that's a, a future work. Actually, I forgot to mention that I will mention that after that. This is a joint work with. Um, uh, I should have said that because. Let me go, that's a joint work with, uh, so my former student, Marina Ferreira, who is now in Helsinki, Sarah Merino, who is uh, in between Sussex and Vienna, and Mikael now is actually, was a, a student from, uh, from Ecole Normale uh, uh, Supérieure in uh, M1. Uh, so, so this year he was the first at the aggregation. Uh, and in fact, he, he was in charge of extending the model to the, to uh, including division, he did it, so, but we, we have not yet finished, so I will not present that. But uh, among other things, he also spotted a mistake in our paper, he corrected it. Um, so, uh, 
these young people, they are amazing. Uh, okay. Uh, so the other movie uh, that uh, I wanted to show to, sh to show that uh, we are not uh, not at all uh, pioneers in this case is a movie by Alex Fletcher where uh, obviously he has a more efficient uh, procedure. So where I hear simulates a, a, a basically a, a, a tumor with a necrotic core and the proliferative uh, um, uh, skin and some uh, quiescent uh, cells in the middle. So it's, this is this is uh, something that's uh, been uh, quite uh, quite popular. And um, right, so um, but here now uh, the problem is that uh, with a, a microscopic model, finding a theoretical solution is difficult because the minimization problem is not convex. The solution is not unique. And there are many close by in, uh, local equilibria. It turns out that if you try to translate this problem into a continuum description, it's simpler, in particular because the continuum description has a, a unique, uh, unique uh, solution. And uh, maybe you can uh, ask yourself why a continuum uh, description. It turns out that it may be uh, interesting. Let me show you some examples. Okay, so here again, when I'm playing with uh, hydrogel, so this is this, uh, so you see that in this beach, uh, there is a small uh, powder that you put on water, and what's happening is that these beads, these small beads of uh, this hydrogel, they swell, and uh, they, they become uh, bigger and bigger. In fact, in the end, it says that the, the uh, final volume can be 100 times the, uh, the initial volume of the beads, right? So, so this, is, this calls for a continuum description. You don't want to describe any uh, single of these beads uh, alone, right? Uh, actually, recently I found another uh, absolutely mesmerizing application of this, which I want to show, uh, which is this one. Okay, so that's what's happening is that the Los Angeles uh, Water uh, Management uh, Department decided to do something against drought. So they have this big uh, reservoir that stores drinking water for, uh, for LA. And they decided to pour in these things that, which are called shade balls, right? So shade balls, these are just, you know, uh, balls like, you know, boule de pétanque, like this big. So this is a, <clears throat> this is a plastic, poly polyethylene, it's hollow, and it's filled with water to make it, uh, to, 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 to give some inertia. They have poured 100 millions of these in this uh, reservoir. Right? And that costs like uh, $30 million. Uh, so you can see the motion of these beads, right, in the water. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, interesting. They push themselves, you know, so you'd like really to, to understand this motion. But you have 100 million of these. So, uh, um, so it's, a, it's, a, bit, uh, it's a, bit, uh, a bit huge. Actually, you can see it's fantastic because you have some, you know, you have some patterns. You have local, you know, crystal ordering with some uh, with some uh, uh, faults. And uh, I mean, uh, LA was really kind to uh, give this opportunity to physicists to make a real uh, real scale experiment. Uh, so the whole reservoir was co in the end was covered with these shade balls, right? So, and of course, uh, you know. It looks like the, the excellent bad idea because uh, there are several problems with these. So um, first of all, you need to fill the balls with water to provide uh, ballast. And it turns out that it's been shown that uh, you need more water to fill the balls than you save by, uh, OK, so that's one thing. So then uh, apparently it gives a perfect medium for 
uh, you know, for bacteria, which for drinking water is not uh, ideal. And also, uh, this is plastic. So in fact, of course, it leaks chemicals in the water. So not only you have bacteria, but you have also chemicals in your drinking water. So, uh, so that's uh, costed 30 uh, million. OK, so this is for next time. Uh, so um, 30, 30 million dollars. So each ball is a, 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 third, of a, a, a third of a dollar. Um, so, so that's a uh, reason for using a continuum description. OK, so let's go to the continuum uh, description. And first, the equilibrium. As I said, this is uh, this going to be simpler because we get a unique solution. Uh, so now we are going to state the problem as follows. So we have, so, so we have a continuum field of average volume. So we are going to assume that at any given point, we have only one kind of particles with a, a given volume, which I call tau of x. And the external potential is a function of the position and of the volume, like it was before the very, uh, radii. And I have an unknown particle density. So I, have a, I fix the total number of particles. And the energy is going to be, uh, so the analog of the sum of the potential energies is going to be the integral of v of x tau of x times the local density. And I want to enforce the non-overlapping condition, saying that I cannot put more uh, particles than I have uh, uh, available space. Available space, uh, so basically that means that the volume, the total volume occupied by the particle will be the particle density time, particle density times the average volume, and this total volume is less than, say, uh, available volume, say, with, with, with the right units will be one. And so the admissible configuration will be, OK, uh, find densities. They need to be non-negative, satisfy the non-overlapping condition, and fix the total density. And you seek a uh, minimum of this energy subject to this admissible configuration here. Um, so here I make some assumptions. They are not at all uh, needed uh, minimal assumptions. These are assumptions that uh, will allow me to carry the, uh, the, ana the, uh, the analysis up to the end. Uh, so what's important, in fact, is not so the potential itself, but rather this function, which is uh, v of x tau of x, which I will call w of x, and I will call it the effective potential. I will assume that is, is like a little bit like a convex potential. So basically, it goes to infinity at infinity. I'm assuming that it has a single minimum, uh, the single critical point, and I also assume that the level sets are uh, compact uh, connected uh, with a strictly positive uh, uh, measure, uh, uh, surface measure, right? So uh, in other words, I cannot uh, get some uh, level set that are, uh, say, single points or points uh, of, of, di of, of lower dimension than dimension uh, the space minus one, okay? You have, you have we're in dim dimension D, so the surfaces will be dimension D minus one. So this is a positive measure in dimension d minus one. And uh, I will assume that, uh, I mean, my medium can carry more particles than, than I, I have. So that I will always have a solution. I mean, I, I, I can hope to have a solution. OK, so if I have these solutions, then the uh, assumption, the solution is very, uh, is very simple. Basically, you are going to take the maximal density until uh, you, and you fill the level sets of the potential until you have exhausted your number of particles, right? So uh, this is something that's sometimes called the, the bathtub principle. So basically, it's like filling a bathtub, uh, right? So, OK, so, so basically, uh, your your, your beads are going to to fill uh, to fill uh, the volume uh, until uh, until a point. So here, this uh, height has to be the same as here, right? 
So that's the level set here in, we're in, uh, we're in 1D, so the, the, the surface, the level set is dimension zero. It's a set of points. So the, this is the, the, the boundary of the, say, the tumor, if you like. And uh, the potential energy, uh, uh, so the, 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 the feeling stops when, uh, so, so you feel by, by, say, by potential energy isoline until you have exhausted the number of particles, right? So that's basically uh, the idea. So, uh, yes, because here, uh, so y yes, because uh, I'm, I mean, uh, sorry, here I, I mean one D. So essentially, this is a, this is a, this is a, yeah. You, we assume that. Uh, that the, the bits cannot overlap, okay? So if they overlap, of course, it's a different problem, but uh, it's, it would be a problem in 2D, okay. right? Because compared to your picture, you have to think of a layer. Right, so here, so here uh, I have a 2D potential, so here I see it on the side, if you like. So this is the, the potential isoline. So say I, uh, I, I put my bits, so I, I, until I, I suppose I have capital N bits, but uh, I already put p beads p before n, so they will uh, fill this level. Uh, this they will fill this uh, this set, and then I put the uh, additional beads. And they, as I fill, as I fill in with beads, I always uh, feel uh, the boundary of the uh, of the set is going to always to be a, a level set of the potential, right? So that's uh, that's the idea. So basically. And so below here, you are getting the barrier, the maximal density, which is the inverse of the uh, volume of your particles, uh, until you reach the boundary of the, uh, say, tumor, and zero above. And so the problem is, what is the condition determining omega n? So first of all, omega n is a set of points where the potential energy is less than a certain value, which is the potential energy on the on the, on the on the boundary, and this uh, potential energy on the boundary is such that p of u n p of u n is the number of particles. Uh, so it should be a capital N here. So p of u capital N is the number of particles in the level set uh, of um, level set value u n. And you need, uh, so this uh, function p of little u is the integral of, oh, God, there are so many typos. So this is little u here for the, for the so p of u is uh, the integral of the, say, available density, the barrier density, for all points x, which have an energy which is be between zero and the value u, right? So that gives you the number of particles which are with a level set below <laughs> u, right? And to determine uh, uh, the boundary omega n, you determine u n by saying that this number applied to u capital N is equal exactly to n, right? Okay, so you, you're just saying that uh, you're picking up the level set that is such that you have uh, below uh, that level set, you have capital N particles. Right, so, uh, so as I said, P of U is the number of particles enclosed by the level set W of X equals U. So you have this level set. P of U is the number of particles enclosing that level set. Right, so this is the equilibrium. And so you see there is a unique solution. Of course, you need assumptions. Of course, if you had some point masses uh, somewhere, then there may be not a unique solution. But if you assume that uh, things have a density, the n, n is, a, is, a, is a, say, an L1 function, for instance, then it's a unique solution. Um, so that's basically solved the, the equilibrium problem. And now uh, I want to, uh, so that's basically something which is known. Actually, you can uh, find proof of this uh, in uh, textbooks. But uh, I'm interested in what's happening uh, when the potential changes and also the volume changes, right? So what I have now is I have a potential that I introduced, I introduced the time variable back. 
And also I assume that the volume is a function that depends on time. So here I'm going to assume that this volume is fixed, uh, sorry, is, uh, is given. However, in practice, it's also uh, self-consistently coupled with the solution of the problem. I will show you how uh, 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 next. So you assume that you have these two functions, and of course the minimization problem gives you, at any given time, you take the density n of t, which is a solution of the previous minimal pro uh, minimization problem with this frozen t, so with the potential v, which is the one that corresponds to t, and with the volume tau, which corresponds to t. And still with this constant number of particles, we assume that we have no creation or sinks of particles, right? Uh, so the energy now is, uh, so the, the, the problem is written like this, you, you fix the t, so the energy at time t is given by this, the admissible configuration set is given by this, and n of t is the solution of this minimization problem and is given by the formula as, uh, as uh, said uh, before. So now you see what's happening is that Basically, at a given time, you had filled. So suppose you are, you're, only your particles are, are swelling, but not uh, the potential is just fixed, but the, partic the particles are swelling. So before they were occupying, you know, these, uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, these extension, but then they have swell, so they have swollen, so uh, they have more volume, so they need to occupy a, a bigger space. So these points have moved to here, this point has moved to here. But the problem is that I need to know not only the, how the boundary moves, but I, know, I need to know how every point moves. And the reason why I need to know the motion of every point is that because, in fact, my volume tau is, uh, we will see a, a Lagrangian quantity, so it follows, with the, it follows the cells, but the, 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 the growth of the cell depends on the intake of nutrient. And that depends on where they are. Right? So in order to de determine later this function tau, I need to know where this, the given cell is. So I need to follow each given, given cell. So I need, to I need to reconstruct the motion of, the, of each point, and so I need to find a velocity v, that's a, satis that's a solution of the continuity equation. And of course, I find the closure problem again because I have a, a so n is known because in a, a n is found by the minimization problem, but I need to find v. And again, I have a, a single uh, scalar equation for a vector, I have the closure problem. So now I'm going to introduce these other principles that basically the minimal <laughs> displacement principle that I uh, introduced in the microscopic case in order to see how I can define the V. And so the first uh, thing that we are going to enforce is the called the non-swapping uh, condition. So let me, rather than explaining you in words, What's the non-swapping condition? Let me give you a, a movie where you will uh, see an illustration of a case where the uh, non-swapping condition is not satisfied. So again, these are dear shade balls, and this is a commercial from the company. Okay, so here you see swapping, right? So when you, f when you blow on your, uh, <coughs> on your um, say C ocean of shade balls, right? They, you know, they do not, they, they, are, they are limited in their motion, right? Because they are sort of, but of course, if there is a violent phenomenon like a, like a, uh, like a hurricane, then of course, then maybe some balls will be able to uh, jump and uh, they are going to swap their position. So here in this, uh, what I'm going to, to show, to present is a case where this cannot happen. Okay, so only a mild weather. Okay, so. <coughs> right. So how are you going to do that? So again, the important quantity is that number of particles enclosed by a level set. So if I take a point X, I can consider the level set uh, uh, passing through X, right? So let me let me give you a, a picture. So I have uh, so I'm in two D. So I'm going to draw the level sets, right? Right. Okay. So now I take. So suppose the this is the boundary of the tumor, right? So omega n is the uh, the whole domain enclosed by this 
level set. Let me take a point inside the tumor. Uh, let me take a point X. Then I can draw the level set passing through X. Given the assumptions I made on W, then it's a smooth uh, C infinity uh, manifold. And then I'm going to denote by pi of X and T. Of course, this picture you know, evolves in time, right? But I can count the number of particles inside this level set enclosed by uh, the, in, enclosed by the level set passing through x, and I'm, that I'm going to call pi of x and t. That's the, uh, really the important quantity. And so what I'm going to, uh, so this is, a, this is a, basically, this is a, uh, in words, uh, in mathematical words with the drawing that I made, uh, what I call sigma p, right? So this is, so, so here, I have pi of xt, which is the number of particles <coughs> inside level set passing through x. And so if I call p uh, this function, this, uh, the value of pi of xt, then uh, the level set itself, I'm going to call it sigma sub p, right? So this is the definition of sigma sub p. Sigma sub p is the set of point i which have the same value, uh, which have the value pi of yt is equal to p, right? Okay, so it's actually the boundary of the volume omega p, what I'm going to call omega p is actually the inside. So what the, the, the shaded area here. And of course, all this de depends on T. So you can see what is the non-swapping condition. The idea is that when the material swells, then basically I cannot have a particle that jumps from here to outside here. So that means that basically the number of particles enclosed in this level set will remain constant. So that means basically that the function pi will uh, be constant in the motion of the particles. So this is what we are going to say. However, there is a small subtlety. This is not, this definition is only valid if the, um, <coughs> the uh, sigma p is connected. And this is not the case in dimension one. Okay, so in order to make a more uh, rigorous definition, uh, and this is where Michael came, he suggested that we say that the non-swapping condition means that if I take two particles on the same level set at a given time, then there is a neighborhood in time where they will still be on the same level set. And contrary, if I take two particles that are not in the same level set, then during a certain neighborhood in time, they will stay uh, on a different level set. <laughs> So that's basically a kind of a local version of this principle that the number of particles keeps constant. But this is the one that actually uh, carries the uh, physical assumption. It turns out that in 1D, this form of the non-overswapping uh, principle is always satisfying. Uh, and so, uh, and so <clears throat> we are saying, so this is basically the expression that I said here that we are, uh, assuming that we are staying on the same level set or not according to whether we, we were on or not at the initial time. And in dimension one, there is, this condition is basically empty. However, in dimension larger than two, then uh, this condition uh, carries uh, uh, content. And the content is the one that I said at the beginning that the uh, function pi is uh, constant in the motion of the particles. Right, so this is, okay, this is basically the same illustration as this with the two different times. Okay, so in dimension two, uh, basically the, uh, the non-swapping condition is equivalent to saying that um, uh, then the, uh, so the, when you, when you follow a particle in its uh, uh, trajectory, the, the, the function pi is constant, 
right? So if this function, this particle evolves, the function, the, the number of particles that are enclosed in the in this level set is constant, and that uh, that uh, provides a, a condition on the normal velocity of this particle to to the level set. So new here is the uh, normal ve uh, normal vector to the level set. So actually the drawing here. So you have a normal vector to the level set, nu, which is uh, nothing that the normalized gradient of pi. And the normal velocity, so the projection of the velocity of this point to this normal must be minus dt pi over grad pi. <coughs> so that's what the non-swapping condition tells you. It gives you a condition on the normal velocity to the level set, right? So if you have a swelling material with non-swapping condition, the normal velocity must be equal to minus DTP over grad P, where pi is the number of particle enclosed in a given uh, level set. And uh, this is on, only in dimension larger than two. In dimension one, this is not true. Okay, so we have determined the normal velocity. We are kind of uh, halfway because we still need to determine the tangential velocity. And uh, the, you know, the problem is not unique then because you, what you could, what you could uh, do is the following. So I have a, a, given, a given level set, so it's a given uh, sigma p, right? So you know to which extent it's going to move, to move in the normal direction, so in which, to which extent a point or a cell sitting at this point is going to move in the normal direction, it's with which speed, but it doesn't tell you to which speed it will move in the tangential direction. And if you think of it, you could, in this two-dimensional case, you could add any uh, tangential motion which was, would respect, say, the fact that uh, two particles uh, keep the same distance, and that's always possible. Uh, any any uh, motion along uh, this, uh, this curve would, 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 would satisfy the non-swapping condition. So the, the tangential velocity is not, uh, is not, uh, is not uh, unique. And this is due to the fact that we are really uh, sort of uh, using, uh, looking at static problems. You know, in statics, uh, uh, see if you just, if you do not introduce uh, um, uh, continuum mechanics, uh, then the problem is not unique. If you take a beam, right, and you take a three uh, points to support it, and you want to compute the reaction force on these three points, then uh, there is no, not a unique solution. If you have two, then it's, it's clear. You know what is the reaction force in the, these two points, but if you have three, then there is not a unique solution. It's an underdetermined problem because, uh, you know, uh, what really matters is the sum, uh, the resultant of the, of the, of the reaction force and the, and the torque. But this is two conditions. You have three points, so you have one in the termination. So it's, cl it's classical that statics uh, mechanics uh, beam problem are uh, have not a unique solution. If you want to compute the reaction of the uh, support, what you have to introduce is you have to introduce the, uh, the flexion of the beam, so the, the ability of the beam to, 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 to bend. And uh, so that means introducing a constitutive law, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will be able to compute this, right? So basically, we are doing a kind of a similar thing. We are just uh, using a kind of similar principle as this. And so it's not a surprise that we do not have a unique solution. Right, so, but remember we had uh, this idea that uh, we wanted the, 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 the velocity as small as possible. So in some sense, we have a minimal 
minimality principle in the solution we want to, to, to find. And why we, we want to find this? Because in some sense, as we have seen in the, in the movies, we are in, in systems which have a lot of friction, which are kind of an overdamped regime. So in some sense, it's rather uh, uh, natural to think that they will try to move as, as little as possible, right? So we are going to apply this principle as a surrogate to the missing information that, uh, we, uh, uh, that we don't have. Okay, so this is how I'm going to determine the parallel velocity. So uh, I'm going to decompose the velocity that I'm looking for into the parallel and the perpendicular velocity. The perpendicular velocity, I know it already. It's given in terms of the function pi, which itself depends on, uh, on the density, on the solution. And so now, uh, I still have in mind that I want the velocity to satisfy the continuity equation. So if I rewrite the continuity equation, knowing that the density is known and is equal to 2 minus 1, is, the, is going to give you this. So it's basically the divergence of the parallel component of the velocity is equal to right-hand side, which is uh, basically the other term of the continuity equation. There is a dTn, and then there is a divergence of the normal uh, velocity. So this is known now because I know this, so this is known and I need to solve this equation. So now it's not even clear that there is a solution at this level because there is a compatibility condition. If you have a tangent vector field uh, to, uh, to, the, to the surface sigma p such that the divergent, parallel divergence, this is a parallel divergence of A is f, right? then uh, f must satisfy that its average over the surface is zero. Okay, it's average over the surface weighted by uh, a surface uh, measure which is called a coarea. So this is a, the natural measure on the surface that makes this kind of uh, integral invariant by change of parameterization. Right, so you, you have this, this constraint. So somehow here we have this equation. This f is determined by uh, the solution of the minimization problem and uh, the first, the previous step. So it's not clear at all that uh, this guy satisfies this condition. Actually, it can be shown uh, that it does, right? So in some sense, this non-swapping condition does the good job of allowing for a parallel velocity to exist. Now we know that the velocity v parallel exists. Can it be zero? Can it be, could it just be zero? That would be very convenient. Well, no, because uh, of course zero would be kind of minimal, but if you imagine a case where the growth is very uh, inhomogeneous, like here, and this is the level surface, then it's clear that you will have to push cells in this direction in order to allow for uh, for space for these uh, for these growing uh, growing part. In fact, this is a heuristic argument, but you can actually uh, show by a counterexample that you you cannot you cannot uh, if you're given a, a growth uh, term and and uh, you cannot just assume that the parallel velocity is zero. So you really have to find a non-zero par parallel velocity. So you know that you, you will find one, but unfortunately you have many solutions of this, right? You have many solutions of this. When it exists, you have many solutions, so now you need to pick one. And so this is where the minimal displacement principle comes in. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, somehow the parallel velocity minimizes uh, kind of uh, kinetic energy, meaning that I want V parallel to be as small as possible. And so that energy is uh, energy it's the kind of it's a kind of uh, kinetic energy for the parallel motion. So it's written that way. So here there is a weight. So you can forget it, but basically uh, it may it may happen. It depends on the modeling uh, assumptions, but it may happen that <coughs> you have to weight the uh, square of the uh, velocity by by some way depending on the volume and again you integrate over this measure this co area <laughs> this is gives you the uh, kinetic energy this guy is the kinetic energy density and you try to find uh, v parallel to be uh, the minimizer of this kinetic energy among the w parallel uh, that satisfy the uh, the uh, parallel uh, divergence constraint. 
Uh, well, it turns out that this problem has a unique solution. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually a kind of a Darcy law, but a Darcy law in the parallel direction. So it's a gradient of a function, a parallel gradient of a function defined on the surface. And uh, this function theta satisfies a uh, kind of Laplace Beltrami equation with a weight here, right? And this has a unique solution in the uh, space of function which have zero mean, right? So this is uh, uh, the assumption, the, 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 uh, the key behind this is the assumption that we have connected uh, surfaces sigma p, connected uh, with finite non-zero d, d minus one measure. Uh, because basically, this is, a, this is a result about somehow the, the cohomology of, of, the, of the surface. So basically, all our surface sigma p are uh, 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 homeomorphic to a sphere. Right? And so in this case, you can see that the condition uh, for the existence uh, of and the uniqueness of the solution of this problem is to, uh, for instance, to, sa to satisfy that there is a zero average. So we are at the end of, the, of our journey almost. So we know that, uh, so if I recap here, I have a, a um, minimization problem that has solution equals to tau minus one until we reach a certain uh, energy level and then zero then. Uh, the movement uh, normal to the velocity is going to be given by this uh, uh, object where pi is the, as I said, this is given by this function. This is the number of particles enclosed by level set uh, W of x of t. And the parallel motion is uh, going to satisfy uh, this um, uh, Laplace Beltrami. So you have, it's like a, you have a, an onion with several skins and on each skin of the onion you have, uh, you have a, a Laplace Beltrami uh, problem to solve. So it's a very complex uh, model, but okay, this is what a very simple heuristics give you. Well, the last uh, part of our journey is to actually say how tau is uh, computed, right? So in, part in particular, uh, the swelling rate would, should be a Lagrangian quantity attached to each particle because it depends on the intake of the nutrients if you think of a cell, right? So it should satisfy a uh, transport equation with the right-hand side, which is the swelling rate, okay? So it says that along the trajectory of the cell, the tau evolves uh, in time according to this rate. And so this introduces a nonlinear coupling between the, the, the whole problem, the velocity in particular, and and uh, uh, the volume tau, which we uh, so far assume given, right? Uh, so there is some, uh, so we don't have an existence proof for, for this problem, but at least we have a kind of a sanity check because somehow you know that for equations like this to be well posed, you need a V to be uh, smooth enough, right? Uh, it's some, it's some, it seems from the construction before that we determine V in kind of a crazy way, and it's not clear that V is smooth enough. It, in fact, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it's, it's rather, uh, if, with the assumptions that we've made on the regularity of the potential, in fact, it's, uh, it's rather clear that if you suppose that the potential and the initial volume are C infinity, then, uh, so if you start with a, a function uh, the tau, which is a C infinity except and the singularity at x equals zero, then V will be in C, C infinity except at the singularity x equals zero. Of course, the singularity x equals zero is really singularity because there the, the, the level set are reduced to a point. So all, the, all what I said uh, before does not hold, right? But uh, as soon as you are away for the singularity, everything is C infinity. And conversely, and this is, there is a typo I forgot to correct. So this is V. So if V now is in C infinity, then uh, uh, showing, uh, except at the critical point, then tau, the solution of this, will be in C infinity. Uh, you see that's going to be uh, as long as, so it's going to depend on the characteristic. So as long as the characteristic do not meet the singularity x equals zero, in finite time or do not reach infinity at finite time, then the solution will be defined in C infinity. 
tau will be defined in infinity. So, sorry, this is v and tau here. So somehow it's a sanity check that you uh, you can bootstrap uh, the argument uh, in at least in the space of C infinity functions. So I know that's not a nice space, but uh, uh, if you are if you are trying to uh, do less regularity, then it becomes a bit tricky. Uh, so for instance, there is a, something that we can ensure if we have a, so for instance the swelling rate, which is uh, say linear in tau with some conditions, then we can ensure that no characteristic will reach x equals zero or infinity in finite time just because you have an exponential control on, on tau because of that. Right, so this is uh, the, the, so this, this is the setting of this uh, swelling uh, problem. So now let me, so this is, I mean, the end of the journey. There is really a starting point, really uh, setting the problem. There are many, many questions which are open. But uh, the important thing, let's go back to the discussion about the validity of the Darcy law. Uh, so first, the rules that, so we have, uh, we have applied very simple rule, I would say almost null hypothesis uh, for, for a growing swelling medium. Uh, it looked like very reasonable. And what we get is uh, uh, something that different from Darcy and the Healy show model. And one of the reasons is that with Darcy law, you will always find a parallel velocity which is equal to zero. You always grow in the direction of the, of the potential, in the normal direction. You don't have any parallel direction and any parallel motion. Here, we do allow uh, parallel motion. So here, we can say that, uh, the, of course, we want to make this parallel motion as small as possible, but we cannot make it zero. That's not possible with these assumptions. Right, so so we re we definitely have a different uh, different uh, say prescription uh, uh, from uh, Darcy law. So now you can question the the usefulness of this because you could say, okay, Darcy law is super simple. This is super complicated. What do we gain? Okay, so then I grant you that uh, maybe that's an argument. And so uh, uh, I think still it's interesting to reflect on the validity of the assumptions that you're making in the modeling because uh, you know, it makes you maybe wiser for the future, right? Um, also, the, the point is that uh, the numerical simulation of this model might not be so tricky. Actually, I'm thinking of, uh, I've not done it, but I'm having in mind some, some ways to accommodate for these, uh, you know, uh, onion layer type problem in such, uh, in a way that could be, could, be having a, could, be, could be feasible. In any case, it's a challenging problem for numerical analysis. I would say it's interesting per se, I think. Uh, so now, as I said, it's a null, uh, null model in the sense that there is absolutely zero biological hypothesis. So things that you could add and that are doable, and we started to do it, in particular with Michael. Uh, you could say, okay, this, uh, this, this, this confining potential V is very artificial, right? Uh, it's supposed to model, for instance, for a tumor, the confinement by the surrounding tissue. But uh, in fact, you have, you do have adhesion between cells. So you should have, you should have contact interactions between nearby particles. Yeah, you could add it. Then you will modify probably some things, but this is something that you uh, can add to the, to the model. Cell division, this is, uh, we've done, uh, this is what Michael has done. And we, we have a, a kind of a preliminary work. Uh, what he has done also is actually uh, adding a few fuzzy, fuzzy boundary because uh, often there is a, a mushy zone between the tumor or, and, and the, the rest of the tissue. And so you, you could account this, in some sense, this is a zero mo temperature model, right? But you could have some fin finite temperature. And finite temperature would mean that there is a there is a there is a smooth transition between the tumor and and the boundary. This is uh, something that also uh, um, Michael has done. So we could of course coupling couple to chemical signaling or nutrient transport in this uh, equation for how the the, the the tumor grows, the the, the volume grows. 
Uh, we could say, okay, it's not reasonable to have a single uh, particle size at any point. So if you are in a continuum description, you should allow for a statistics of size, then it's possible. It would lead to some kind of kinetic modeling. You could add many particles. In particular, one thing that we are thinking about is actually trying to add the uh, shape of the particles. So what happens if instead of spheres, you take, say, for instance, ellipsoids, so you would need uh, in the continuum model a way to, to account for this, uh, this orientation. Uh, and of course, there are many, many mathematical problems from existence uniqueness, derivation from micro model, also from singular limits uh, from other macro models, right? So maybe I can derive this, I could, I could, I could think of deriving this model from, um, from a uh, uh, porous medium equation with an isotropic uh, diffusion tensor, something like that, that may, may, be, may be doable. Uh, I, I haven't tried it, but this is something that we have in mind. Uh, yeah, so I think that's my last slide. Uh, so I'm a bit uh, ahead of time, but may, I think it's uh, good to stop here. Thank you very much.